speaker for this two-day conference. And uh, our final keynote speaker is Greg Cross, founder and CEO of Soul Machines. Soul Machines is a deep tech AI research company that brings life to the digital worlds of our future. Greg is one of the original tech nomads, spending his career living in every major tech market in the world. He now splits his time between the United States and here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, and creates businesses that compete on the international stage. Greg is chairman of luxury fashion brand, Daddles In, and is also the Sir John Logan Campbell Executive in Residence at the University of Auckland Business School. He was recently inducted into New Zealand's Technology Hall of Fame as the recipient of the 2019 Flying Kiwi Award and was an Auckland Grammar Augusta Award winner in 2020. With AI now reality that will affect many aspects of our lives, I'm certain that we are all extremely keen to hear from Greg about the future of AI and what it can do for our organisations. Please make welcome to the stage, Greg Cross. Thank you. Wow. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Jenny May, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, awesome to be here this afternoon. Uh, just literally got in from, uh, from New York uh, over the weekend. I've been on the road for a couple of weeks. So I was very grateful for the British Open on, uh, on what was it, Sunday morning and, and Monday morning when I was wide awake at 2 o'clock and I had nothing else to do. So um, I'm here to talk about AI. Um, and the, when, when I talked to Anne about doing this, we talked about the future of AI and what it could mean for your business. But I kind of wanted to reframe it a little bit because AI is literally eating the world today. Something that for most of us existed in the world of science fiction. Going to the movies and, and, and watching killer robots come along to kill us to rule over us and take over our entire planet. That's the sort of the, the picture we have of artificial intelligence. Yet, you know, literally in the last few months, the world has changed and it has changed uh, in a lot of ways. But I wanted to start off today by introducing you to a couple of my AI mates. Uh, and seeing this as a sports conference, I thought I'd bring some of my, my AI um, sporting celebrities along. Are we in the metaverse yet? Just kidding. Hey, Mello, Jack, can you please speak English? I don't have my Mandarin module yet. No problem, Mello. I was asking how your golf was going. Cool. So, a couple of um, sporting icons. Um, the first, maybe not so well known here in New Zealand, but NBA All-Star Camelo Anthony, one of the longest serving players in the NBA, just retired this year, is the uh, uh, FIBA ambassador for the big international basketball tournament in uh, Manila later this year. Um, the other one, some of you know, guys, some, some of you are as old as I am in the room will remember Jack, uh, maybe as he was right there. I spent some amazing time with Jack Nicholas last year. He's 83 years old in, in real life. Um, we have made, literally made Jack and his digital twin 38 years old. Really, really interesting phenomena. You know, we talked to a bunch of celebrities about creating AI versions of them over the last few years. And who would have thought an 83-year-old sports legend would want to be first? And Jack put his hand up straight away and said, I want to do this. This, for me, is about my legacy. This is about how I make my brand and everything I've achieved in the world you know, relevant to people who are coming in, kids that are coming into the game today. And as you can see from, from that experience that we've created, we moved, we, you know, Jack wanted to be 38 because that was the last time he won the British Open. That was when he played the best golf of his career. And to give you some idea as to what Digital Jack does today, you saw him speaking Mandarin um, there. Mandarin in his own voice, except the voice, just like all of his animation and everything in that short video was all created by artificial intelligence. So Jack doesn't speak a word of Mandarin. He doesn't speak a word of Japanese. Yet 
Today, Digital Jack is representing one of the biggest merchandising, golf merchandising equipment companies in Tokyo, speaking Japanese uh, to the people who visit the website there. Speaking Japanese in his own voice. You know, think of the potential of this in terms of the future of fan experience, the way in which fans will experience the world of sport as we move forward in the future. So this time last year, when I was talking about AI, I'd get invited along to tech conferences and I'd speak to tech audiences about artificial intelligence. Um, so last year it was all about R&D labs and innovation teams and big corporates. Lit yet literally over the last six months, AI is now an app on every smartphone in the world. I haven't asked this question because I haven't spoken in New Zealand in a while. How many people have a chat GPT app on their smartphone? Quick hands up. Yeah, a few of you, a handful of you. Catch up, people. Your kids have it on their smartphone. Your kids are literally doing their homework using chat GPT today. So this is not, you know, this is not technology that lives in IT departments or in technology departments um, today. It was last year. But this year, this is innovation that has been driven by consumers, by kids, literally from the bottom up. And it's changing every aspect of our society. Every aspect of our society. And I know a lot of people are really scared about it. And you'll have, you know, you'll, if you're like me, you read about, read about it in the newspaper. And Elon Musk wants to move to Mars um, because he's scared of the robots, I guess. Um, he wants to stop AI development so he can invest in a new AI company and catch up to the guys that are already 12 months ahead of him. Um, but, you know, I mean, seriously, though, AI is now being driven. The innovation in artificial intelligence has been literally driven from the grassroots, from smartphones, from, from consumers, from kids. Um, teachers, school teachers today, you know, are now having to figure out how do I make sure the kids are actually doing their own homework? How do I change the coursework so even if they are using ChatGPT, they actually have to think about how they use ChatGPT in order to do their homework and actually learn something in the process of education. So the world has changed. This world has changed dramatically over the last hey, six months. Hey, Nova here again. I'm brought to life using Soul Machine's autonomous animation platform, HumanOS, and their patented digital brain. If I appear to be thinking and feeling it's because, in a digital sense at least, I'm alive. So, seeing this as a New Zealand conference, it's, uh, I should give you some, a little bit of background on my company, Soul Machine. So, we're a spin-out of the University of Auckland, so deep tech research firm that was founded by... Um, my co-founder, Dr. Mark Sager. Mark is an uh, alumni of the world of Weta Digital. He won Oscars for his work on the movies Avatar and then, uh, and then Kong. So AI is not just one thing. AI is a whole bunch of different technologies. Um, and you know, many of them we've read about. You know, we'd have read about DeepMind and their work in deep learning and you know, maybe their experiment with AlphaGo and teaching AI to play chess that's going back five or six years ago. ChatGPT is a new, a new form of AI called large language models. So um, literally, you know, what a large language model like ChatGPT, it's consumed the content of the internet, and so what it's literally trying to do is predict what word comes next. So in a very, very simplest um, way is one of these things, which is what word comes next. Now, that um, digital person up there is Nova. Uh, you can go talk to Nova on our website, soulmachines.com. She, um, she is the product of over 10 years and 135 million US dollars of research that we as a company have done you know, during the last 10 years. Um, we lead the world in a, in a specialist field of AI called cognitive modeling. What does that mean? That means we can literally simulate human behavior um, using CGI um, assets like Nova, or avatars as they are often referred to. So Nova is an avatar. She's a synthetic avatar, uh, unlike 
um, Jack and Camelo, who you just met, who are digital twins of real life people. So Nova is completely made up. She doesn't exist in real life. And, she's, and you can literally go to her and have a conversation about anything that you want. So she is, in fact, or, or the work that we've done is creating the world's first model of a person. Now, these aren't completely sentient people, but they can respond, emotionally connect with us, and interact in real life. So they are the most digitally alive avatars possible today. So this is you know, work, as I said, we've been doing this stuff now for, for 10 years. Um, we are working with some of the biggest celebrities in the world. So you've seen some of our sporting celebrities. We're also working with Francis Ngannou, um, the former UFC heavyweight champion, recently signed to do a, um, the richest prize fight in the history of um, prize fighting sport. Um, he's fighting uh, Tyson Fury in, in Riyadh in, in October of this year, and Digital Francis will become an integral part of this. Uh, we have a deal, um, another example of, of something we're doing is with the Authentic Brands Group. They own legacy artists, um, you know, so they have the digital rights to legacy artists. Um, Elvis Presley uh, is one of their, um, one of the artists they have the, the, the name, image, and likeness for. No name, image, and likeness is becoming a big issue in the world of sport. You know, I'm sure you, you all read about the big movement in the NCAA in the US last year where, where college athletes can now monetize their name, likeness, and image. Um, I mean, this is a massive movement into this world of AI, AI avatars, and digital fan engagement. So what we focus on is, and what we think about is the way in which, the way in which your fans, you know, fans of your sport, the participants of your sport, will engage in the, in, with, their con with the content that gets produced about your sport in the future. We have way too much content in the world. And the kids that are growing up today don't necessarily associate with the traditional sports of New Zealand or America or any other country in the world. You know, how many 18-year-old you know, kids in America are going to spend four hours on a Sunday afternoon watching an NFL game? You know, not many. You know, so the whole world of sport is rapidly becoming about how do we repackage content in a way that we can deliver experiences that will engage the next generation of consumers. You've seen evolution in, in, in mass sporting media, you know, like television, where you know, in the NFL they have the, the red zone, which basically shows every touchdown you know, continuously on a Sunday afternoon. Or, you know, or there'll be packages put together by Patrick Mahomes, the NFL quarterback from the Kansas City Chief, just for his fans. Kids of today don't follow teams. You know, so the tribalism that we have attached with sport is not about the team anymore. It's about the athlete. You know, when Ronaldo moves from you know, one club to another, you know, the fans go with him. You know, um, I saw today on the way here, Mbappe, half a billion dollars for his next contract you know, as he moves from, from PSG to wherever he goes um, next. So you know, the way in which we think about this, and so this is where digital celebrities become an important part of how we personalize and curate experiences. And if you, um, if you want to understand this, um, literally, if you go to my website or our website, you'll be able to talk to this celebrity. Now, this is not a sports celebrity. Um, any K-pop fans out there? Any K-pop? No? Any, nobody's going to put their hand up and, and, and admit to being a K-pop fan. So, well, you may or may not, some of you may not, may recognize this guy. Hey there, my name is Mark Twan. I'm a musician, singer, songwriter, and dancer. I'm also a digital influencer, sharing my life experiences and connecting with fans all around the world. Oh my God, you're Mark Twan. I love your music so much. Thank you so much for your support and kind words. I'm so glad to hear that you love my music. What was Mark Twan's childhood like? My childhood was pretty normal, I would say. 
I grew up in Los Angeles, California with my family, and I have two older sisters. My parents always emphasized the importance of hard work and education, and they instilled those values in us from a young age. I'm a big fan. How do you write your music? Thank you for being a fan. When it comes to writing music, I draw inspiration from many different sources, personal experience. I'm going to jump over the rest of that. So, um, Mark Twan's a huge K-pop star, member of the boy band GOT7, which I think is the second largest boy band in the world of, um, of, of K-pop. Huge phenomena um, all over the world. Huge cultural phenomena, um, K-pop. We just launched Digital Mark Twan on our website um, at the beginning of last week. Um, uh, he's literally been up on our website for five days. You can go talk to him. If there's a few closet K-pop stars, Jenny May will, will be right there. In five days. So, you know, so we gave, we, we put this out on social media initially on Tuesday of last week. On Thursday, Mark, who has 11 million followers on social media, um, posted about his digital twin for the first time. And in the five days since, uh, since, since then, Digital Mark Twan has had 23,000 personal face-to-face -face conversations, all driven by artificial intelligence. You know, he has, Digital Mark Twan has delivered over 2,100 hours of talk time. Think about that. You know, if he was to go out and hire an army of impersonators to do, the, to do this fan engagement work, it couldn't be done. Mark is, a, is an artist who literally can fill a football stadium in Manila uh, or, or Bangkok to have fans come along and hear him answer questions on a stage. You know, so um, the length of the conversation, people are having, you know, averaging 10 minutes per conversation with this digital twin. And we even have evidence that there are his super fans of social media are now digitally dating him. You know, I'm spending my evening at home talking to digital Mark Twan because this is an experience I can have. So there's Mark in his uh, full 3D. And there's a number of different aspects of AI that bring this digital experience to life. There's the large language model, the or the conversational content, which, I mean, you can go ask um, Digital Mark Twan about any sport, really. I mean, he's been specifically trained on K-pop in his career, but, I mean, he, you can literally ask him questions about anything. He speaks in multiple languages. You saw Jack speaking in Mandarin. I t talked about Jap Jack talking in Japanese. Um, uh, Mark is... Um, Mark is brought to life by our autonomous animation technology. What's autonomous animation? So just to prepare you for that, autonomous animation is what's going on here. My brain animates me, brings me to life. My, my heart is beating, my, I'm breathing between talking, my, I'm choosing my words, I'm expressing my words with emotion and tone of voice, I'm gesturing, my brain is doing that all in the moment and on the instance. And you're sitting there listening, you are wondering what I'm talking about, you're deciding what you feel about what I'm talking about, and that is your brain animating you. So literally what's going on when you're talking with Mark or any one of our um, digital people is they are being animated by a digital brain which simulates human behavior in real time. So what we've done here is literally we've created what we think of as a digital species for the age of AI. We've made these digital people really easy to create. I'll show you in a second um, our creative tool. It's called Digital DNA Studio. You can literally go to our website. You can sign up for Digital DNA Studio. Um, the first 30 days are free, and you can create a digital person like Nova. Uh, you can choose um, what voice she speaks with, um, whether you want an Australian accent, maybe, um, or maybe a, uh, an American, a Southern American accent, um, what language they speak. You know, the di these digital people can speak at least 15 different languages today. Um, we did a big project with the World Health Organization during, um, during the COVID era. Uh, we donated our technology to help out with fake news, and so they created a digital health assistant called Florence. Florence speaks all six languages of the United Nations, and her role during COVID was to 
you know, saying, you know, President Trump's not right, drinking Clorox is not good for your health. Um, that's part of what she did. Obviously, as times have moved on and we've returned to the new normal in, in this post-COVID world, Florence has moved on to take a role in the, in the world of smoking cessation. Um, so, you know, one of the biggest problem, health problems in the world is created by the tobacco industry. So, um, Florence is now an active ambassador, healthcare ambassador for the World Health Organization. So, these digital people work in literally every single industry. I've talked a fair bit about the world of entertainment. You know, imagine a world um, in, in the future of entertainment where, I mean, literally, I mean, all of our celebrities, all of our legends, all of our heroes now have social media accounts. They all interact with people on those social media accounts. Um, we follow them ourselves, you know. And sometimes we become super fans. They literally become, believe it or not, there are, you know, there are super fans out there of celebrities like Britney Spears, you know, who believe they are best friends with Britney because they help get her free from her conservatorship. I mean, literally, these are the types of super connections that are being built in digital worlds using something as, as simple as social media where people feel that level of connection just by posting on their account. You know, and whether it's a, a, you know, a, a musician like Britney or a, a Hollywood actor or a, or, or a sports superstar, there are people out there that feel that strength of connection. And you know, it's been a fascinating five days for us to see that move into the world of bringing that digital twin to life and, and having fans start to interact in real time. So we, we've worked as well as working across the... the um, the field of entertainment and, and getting different company, you know, diff different organisations to think about um, entertainment. Last week, um, I had meetings in New York with the NBA, you know, thinking about you know the way in which the digital Camelo and other digital basketball players can contribute to the way in which they curate content on this, with the sport. Um, San Antonio Spurs, um, Brooklyn Nets, you know, these are all organizations that are now thinking about how does AI, what is the role of AI in the way in which we deliver fan experiences of the future. Uh, another um, amazing Kiwi I bumped into at the airport on my way out of town a couple of weeks ago was Surian Taylor from Animation Research. Um, um, and, you know, once again, using AI, using data to change the way we experience sport. Um, I think most people know that Ian and his team at Animation Research have a contract with the PGA and they do all of the, the ball tracking and all of the stats for, for golf, but they also do the same now for Major League Baseball. And literally, every movement on a baseball field is now tracked and turned into data which can then now be, now be used to simulate interactions. And, you know, over the top of that, you know, literally I could put a digital twin of Shohei Otani, the, um, the Major League Basketball um, um, Player of the Year, and he could be curating or, or presenting a game um, in the way that you want to see the game presented, um, or from the angle or the perspective that you want. So, a lot, I spent a lot of time on that, but the future of this is not just about fan engagement, you know, as we move into the world of business, it's the world of brand engagement. So, here's some of the challenges of this increasingly digital world in which we live in. I mean, the first thing is most of us, most companies, most organizations, we've been publishing digital content for over 20 years. So there is infinite digital content in the world today. Um, so when I want to find something, I don't go to your website or your website to find out something about your organization. What do I do? I Google it. I don't search engine it. I Google it. And you know what Google does as soon as you, know, you go searching for you know, a piece of information? They'll sell that search to a competitor um, or, or, or somebody else. So um, Google is the way in which your brand experience is being personalized today. So think about a world where you can have a digital uh, brand ambassador who can personalize and curate content on a one-on-one -on -one basis just for you. 
Um, think about, so that's the, you know, one of the big problems we have with just infinite digital content. And, and we, we continue to explode this digital content. And it does affect your world um, because it's not, you know, uh, it's not just about the content you want people to see. It's what the, about the people that, the content that people have access to. So, so the world has shifted. So the second big problem with digital content is emotional connection. If you're a brand, if you've worked hard over many years to establish a brand in your, and brand values, you know, which connect you with your, with your customers or, or your, your fans, how do you connect? How do you really connect? Because a real connection is an emotional connection. An emotional connection is you know, literally where we feel like we are personally engaged and personally involved with a brand. You know, there's a reason why... You know, George Clooney reps Nespresso. You know, it's, you know, Nespresso are targeting the buyers of coffee in the household and George Clooney is the best way that Nestle could come up with to connect with those buyers, those coffee buyers in the household. It's an emotional brand connection. You know, imagine a world in the future where you can have an individual conversation with digital George Clooney. Digital George Clooney, digital Mallow are, are literally being rendered in the cloud. They're being broadcast as a video stream from the cloud into your device. So literally, as, as in a few, some of you go and try this experience for yourselves, it's like having a Zoom call with digital Mark Twan or digital George Clooney or whomever else you choose to. So in the world of brand experiences, we're, we're working across a whole wide range of industry sectors. Um, JP Morgan Chase is a client of ours. Um, uh, Fidelity, uh, Morningstar, big financial services organizations, the financial sector, the financial industry, going through massive change at the moment as it becomes a completely digital industry. So huge challenges in terms of how do we create these brand connections in this digital world of the future. Um, the automotive industry, another industry that's going through massive change when you think about it, you know, the shift away from the combustion engine to electric vehicles, the collapse of the distribution channel, okay? Because these, these are real things that are happening, you know. Uh, electric vehicles don't need servicing. So without servicing, you don't have dealerships, you have demo centers. You know? So the world in which Tesla sells and services cars is the world of the future. So every car company in the world is now thinking about how do we create these brand experiences with which we connect um, with our consumers of the, the future. General Motors and Cadillac are customers of ours. BMW, uh, Nissan Infiniti are, are, are clients of ours. In the healthcare sector and the education sector. So you know, one of the, the myths out there is AI is bad. AI is going to steal our jobs. Well, there's some truth to that. You know, new technology, particularly fundamental technology like artificial intelligence, is going to be disruptive in terms of industries and jobs and the way we go about um, providing useful um, services in return for money. So it is going to be disruptive. But we've seen many, many technologies before. Um, I was talking to some of my young colleagues in the U.S., and when I started traveling to the U.S. Um, a, 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 when, in the early days of my tech business, um, and I was living in Boston, it used to take me two days and four flights to get to Boston. I used to have to go Auckland, Honolulu, Honolulu, L.A., overnight in L.A., the next day I'd get up and I'd go to Denver, and then I'd change flights in Denver. And I came home from New York direct, New York to Auckland. Okay? Technology has changed the way in which I can do my job. You know, Zoom and, and our ability to remote work and work from anywhere. So technology has always disrupted and changed the way that we do things, and AI will have that um, result. But um, AI does, you know, the work we're doing in the education sector and the healthcare sector. You know, two sectors, you know, when you stop and think about it, I don't think there's a single New Zealander that could tell me that our education sector and our health sector you know, are better today than they were 50 years ago. Anyone want to argue that one? <coughs> you know, you know, 50 years of economic growth you know, and our, you know, our health care systems and our education systems 
you know, literally are going backwards in many, many aspects. You know, and there's lots of advancements and, and lots of technology that are helping it and propping it up, but imagine a world where, you know, a digital workforce, you know, can augment and assist and fill in gaps uh, in the education and healthcare sector. Um, you know, one of the things we've discovered um, through some of the work that we've done in these sectors is there are many applications where people actually prefer to speak to a digital person. You know, think of in the education sector. How many of you um, did high school French? Yeah, there's a bunch of you would have done high school French or, or some language. How many of you speak that language flu flu fluently? You know, when you go visit that country, I can't. I don't speak French. I don't speak German. I certainly don't, um, Latin was um, one of, probably my best language, but um, that's not a spoken language. So, um, you know, one of the reasons we never learn to speak languages is because we fear the judgment of our teachers and our peers. So we stop putting our hands up and asking questions. So one of the things that we, we, we've noticed in an AI world is a digital language tutor, they don't care whether you do the same lesson once, twice, or a hundred times. They don't even mind if you, you ask the same question a hundred times over. So the removal of the fear of judgment is another area where this can have um, make a huge and direct change. So I've talked through some of the things here. I mean, these digital people are deployable anywhere. They can be deployed in a, in a, um, in a website, uh, in your smartphone app, um, in the metaverse, the 3D worlds of the future. That, uh, that, yeah, you know, I know the metaverse isn't cool anymore. You know, the metaverse was last year's hype cycle from the tech sector. This year it's AI. Um, I think you'll find AI will be a lot more enduring. Um, it is now being talked about as the biggest productivity shift since the PC was uh, invented. I was, when I was in New York last week, I met with the CEO of Pfizer, and we were talking about AI, and this is something that you all need to think about as leaders of your own organization. Um, so AI is being driven in two distinct ways in our organization. If you're a CEO and a leader of an organization, you actually have to have a position about AI in your organization. You actually need to show leadership in this field of artificial intelligence. Um, leadership is not saying we're not having any of that stuff here. That's not leadership. That's, you know, that's the ostrich strategy. That's the head-in-the-sand approach to what is you know, literally going to be inevitable. So as, you know, for one of the first times, you know, this is a technology shift, you know, a massive paradigm shift which you as leaders need to understand, you need to embrace, uh, you need to take it on. So that's the, the first um, thing. The second thing that you, you need to be aware of is AI is being driven up from the bottom up through your organization, okay? Your employees, your team members, you know, they have a chat GPT app on their smartphone. They're sitting there thinking about how is chat GPT going to change my job? How can it help me do my job? You know, the boss wants a report on this tomorrow. I don't have time to write a chat GPT. Can you, can you tell me all of this? Um, um, literally, it's being used in your organization today. And, you know, there's plenty of organizations that ban it. You know, you can't have, you can't use chat GPT inside of our firewall because we don't want our, you know, we're scared of our private data being, you know, being, uh, ended, ending up in the public arena. And look, I'm, you know, that is a concern for every organization. But to suggest that you can take an approach, by, you know, and, and ban it, once again, it's, um, it's taking completely the wrong approach because literally everybody in your organization, the young people in your organization at the very least, are going to be thinking about what ChatGPT can do to make their job easier, better, more productive, more efficient. Um, these are the innovation cycles that we're starting to see um, go on in the world um, literally right now, literally as we speak. Hey guys, today we're going to check out Soul Machine's Digital DNA Studio, which lets you create your own digital person experiences. This is perfect for anyone who wants to bring their creative ideas to life, whether it's for social media, your website, or just for fun. 
First off, let's build our own digital influencer based on me. Using DDNA Blender, we can customize the look to suit your taste. We can select from a range of facial features, skin tones, hairstyles, and even add makeup and clothes. Once we're done designing, we start building our experience. We can create a conversational interaction using GPT with Soul Machine's generative AI skill. This is where we can add a name, choose personality traits, and add specific information or URLs that they should know. You can modify greeting responses, change creativity level, and even select a specific model. Once we've configured the skill, we select the right language, voice options, and customized behavior style. This will make them even more engaging and alive. Finally, we select our camera option and deploy our digital influencer. We have two options for launching either in a full screen experience or using our embed code to launch her in a web widget. It's super easy to do and takes just a few steps to grab an API key. So I'll jump over that. So um, the point of, of that and, sh and showing you that, you know, building this, doing this stuff for yourself is actually really, really easier. Um, so I wanted to spend the last few minutes I have with you um, talking about some of the challenges, you know, and, and some of the things that we, we will all confront as we come face to face with AI in our workplace, in our communities, and um, in society. The first big debate is the, the debate that's going on at the moment is AI going to be good or bad for us? Um, and I've always find it, found it something ironic that the movie industry um, you know, has you know, entertained us for years on, with robots that kill us um, and rule over us. You know, so it's something that you know, we actually love these stories. We've, you know, we've been fascinated by them for a very, very long time. Um, I, was in, um, I was in Hollywood the week before last. I did um, uh, a couple of podcasts on the future of AI um, for um, the Variety magazine, and um, was interesting. My, podca my podcast uh, debuted last week. In the middle, you know, literally two days after the actors all went on strike and joined the scriptwriters on strike. Now, one of the biggest debates, you know, in in this world is, you know, you know, in, in that strike is, you know, um, the 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 the, lot, the battle lines that have been drawn in the movie industry over the use of AI generated characters. Uh, and the way in which the the hard line that the movie industry has taken, and you know, and now the the, the union that that um, represents the actors have come out, and you know, it, it is a major dispute. There are many many different aspects to that dispute, but here we have the first industrial action in the world around you know the future of artificial intelligence, and. You know, our position on AI, because ethics becomes a big part of this world of AI, and, and, and we are, um, in the work that we do, we're a world leader, so that means we actually do have to take an ethical position on what we will and won't do as a company. And I'll come back to the ethics of this in the future, but one of the things that I was, I was very clear about, you know, we're not producing digital twins of actors to act in movies. You know, I fundamentally believe that as humans we do two fundamental things. We protect the future of our species and we tell stories. You know, we tell stories through our families, across uh, the, the generations uh, of our family. So these are two storytelling is fundamentally an innately human um, being. I mean, interestingly enough, even if you think about the whole category of CGI movies, the avatars of this world or the toy stories of this world, you know, I believe one of the reasons we love those movies is there are actors behind each of those characters. There are voices and emotions that we recognize behind these characters. So, you know, I don't believe that AI is going to replace human storytelling in the movie industry. You know, might we see a new genre of movie in the future? Maybe. You know, many of the challenges that the, uh, the unions are actually struggling with the, with the big production companies in Hollywood at the moment actually go back to the previous generation of technology innovation, which was the streaming industry and the enormous profits that can be made you know, over a very, very long time by hit shows on Netflix or, um, you know, and actors not participating in those rewards. But these were, let's be clear, these were technologies and these were platforms that also provided jobs for many actors that 
didn't have them before. So this becomes, you know, for me, a debate about a, a, a way, and a way in which we need to communicate um, with each other about what roles we want these new technologies to have in our society. Ethics is really, really important for us. Um, and the world of ethics becomes, starts off as uh, on most things, it's really black and white, but then it quickly gets into the shades of grey. As a company, we have a, uh, a at a board level, and my board of directors, you know, board of directors, you guys all will have them, you know, they, you, you have some specialist subcommittees, a remuneration subcommittee, um, and uh, an audit and risk subcommittee. Well, we have an ethics sub subcommittee on our board. So, you know, we have decisions to make about what industries. You know, we've had approaches from the gambling industry. Um, should we allow our digital people to be used in the gambling industry? Should we allow our digital people to be used in the sex industry? I mean, these are questions that come up, you know, the internet was commercialised, VHS as a, as a format was commercialised by, by pornography. You know, we've, we've all read that, those stories, we all know that. Um, as a company, you know, we've made decisions there, are, you know, those sectors, gambling, um, sex industry, tobacco, are industries that we don't want to be involved in. We don't want our technology used in those industries. And that sounds really, really easy until you say, well, in today's world, where does gambling st start and finish? You know, you, we've got the casinos, you know, you know, the traditional gambling, which, you know, um, um, we all think about, but gambling and gaming goes, and gaming for gamification just about goes across all aspects of, of society now. Um, so where does it stop and where does it finish? Um, tobacco versus vaping. You know, the, you know um, uh, we, we've had these debates um, around our, um, around our uh, uh, ethics committee table. And here's the most important thing when it comes to ethics. You know, when it comes to the regulatory environment, we're seeing um, a lot more debate now um, at, a, at a government level about um, the regulations we need to put in place to protect the privacy of data. Uh, and the way in which these new technologies impact our societies and our communities. So there's a, certainly a lot of debate going on about that in, in the US at the moment, um, um, which, which I'm, I'm sure you'll read about. And here's the most important thing, because I don't know the answer. I don't, you know, and I, you know, I've worked in the specialist field for a, for a whole bunch of years now, but I don't know all of the answers here. Um, nobody does. Um, that the, the, here's the fundamental thing, we have to have debate, we have to have discussions um, so that you know, we can implement this technology in the most useful ways for society. We've learnt, I would like to think that we've learnt a huge amount from the world of social media and all of the things that that brought to society that we don't like. Okay? You know, the fact that we didn't understand their business model, and the way in which they used and collected personal data. I mean, I, I, for years I used to talk about, you know, those cute little emojis on Facebook. They're not cute little emojis. emojis. They, are, they are profiling you. When you love something, they know you can, they can sell you advertising about the sport that you love or the athlete that you love. That, that's data that is providing insights to who you are as a person. And they've been doing that for decades now. And most of us didn't even know that. So, you know, openness around the business models of, of these worlds is going to be incredibly important. Um, um, fake news. I mean, here, 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 fake news is an interesting one. You know, I mean, we know what damage, you know, fake news has, ha, ha, has wrought, you know, across democracies now. You know, um, you know, deep fake videos, you know, a, a new AI technology where, you know, we've all seen, you know, the deep fake videos of Barack Obama um, or um, I think there's another one being doing the rounds recently, Tom Cruise. Um, that work was not actually authorised by Tom Cruise. They have used his name, likeness and image, you know, um, they've taken existing video content to create new video content using deep fake video. These are open source tools. 
readily available. Anybody who, can, who wants to spend the time figuring out how to use them can, can use them and can produce deep fake content. You know, I, I expect it will have um, a big impact at the next US presidential election um, next year. I, th I think we'll see you know, a whole slew of this. So regulation and discussion around regulation is, is really, really important. Um, you know, in the world of social media, we had fake news. In the world of chat GPT, anybody heard of hallucinations? In the world of chat GPT? Chat GPT hallucinates. It makes stuff up. Okay? Um, hallucination sounds way cooler word than fake news, doesn't it? Yeah, so AI is attempting to be way cooler than social media. Um, um, you know, so hallucination happens because, as I said, a large language model, chat GPT, is just trying to predict, you know, based on the law of averages and, and, the, and the models, what word comes next. It doesn't actually understand the context of the discussion. Um, um, so um, hallucination is something that was a huge issue, and but the, the, here's the thing with AI. The more you use it, the more you interact with it, the better and smarter it gets all of the time. So the, the, the word hallucination, as cool as it might sound, you know, will probably disappear um, at an, an increasingly um, fast rate. So this is a world where innovation at speed is going to be incredibly important. It is a world of productivity, and brand experience, fan engagement that will impact you know, every single one of your organizations and the way in which you connect with your consumers and your fans as you move forward into what you know, I think of as you know, one of the most exciting eras in, in the history of, uh, of the human race. So um, I hope um, you've enjoyed what I've had to say today. I'm going to wrap it up there. Happy to answer any questions that, that you might have.